This is the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series and today's session, What's New with Blackboard Open Content? I'm Jenny Breister on the marketing team at Blackboard and I'll be serving as your moderator today. I'm going to help to field any questions we have in the group chat and keep in mind we are always open to new ideas for topics for this series so let me know if you're interested in presenting or have ideas for a future session. Let's see, and each webinar um, in the series is recorded. Um, we also want to invite you to take a look at the Blackboard uh, Innovative Teaching Series playlist. That's on our, on our YouTube channel, and I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat in a minute. And you'll also receive the recording and presentation slides from today's session in a few days via email. And I also want to invite you to, um, to participate in our professional learning community on our Blackboard community site in Learn, if you haven't already. This PLC is designed to augment the series and create an avenue for ongoing collaboration and dialogue. So when I get that invitation to you in a follow-up, if you haven't already, plan to join in our online PLC. And I'll do uh, a, uh, a little link to both the playlist and to the PLC um, as soon as we get kicked off. For now, I want to invite you to also join us for our next upcoming BIT sessions. We've got some great sessions lined up, and here are the next three. On November 3rd, uh, Janine Richardson, our superstar solution, solutions engineer, um, is going to be talking about universal design for learning in today's classroom. And then on November 7th, Julie Evans, uh, CEO of Project Tomorrow, heads up the Speak Up survey, and she'll be talking about digital Learning Trends, Making an Impact on Student Engagement and Development. It's an annual report. And then on December 1st, Paula Barr, who's a veteran educator and a uh, longtime BITS presenter with Lawrence Public Schools, will be talking about science online and in their hands. So again, we welcome you to join us for upcoming BITS sessions, and I will be sure to put those, uh, those links in the chat so you can sign up for additional sessions if you haven't already. Um, for now, I'd like to introduce our featured presenters, and we've got Jace Howard, our um, Senior Director of Cross-Platform Technologies, and Paulina Babina, with, she's a Product Manager with Open Ed. So take it away, guys. Hey, so uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction um, and for taking the time on a uh, Friday uh, to get an update on what's new with open content. Uh, a little bit about uh, my job, It's uh, a lot of people see it and they're like, what exactly does that mean? I actually have a pretty exciting job at Blackboard. Um, my job is to work across our product lines and uh, the different services uh, and applications we offer and figure out how to best integrate them so that they work together and that the, they are providing the most seamless experience possible for our clients. So I'll pause for a minute and let uh, Polina introduce herself uh, and uh, provide a little more uh, information, and then we'll kick this thing off. All right. Hi, guys. I'm Polina. Um, as it says here, I am the product manager with OpenEd, and I've been here for quite a few years, so hopefully that means I can give you a good rundown of what we do and be able to field any questions. Um, and so I will walk you guys through OpenEd a little bit later. Thank you. Thanks, Polina. So one quick housekeeping item. Um, we're going to start with some slides, uh, and we'll finish with a demo of the new functionality. Uh, for any specific ca uh, use cases or more advanced technical questions, um, we'll certainly be happy to take your contact information and set up a specific time to address any workflow questions for problems you're looking to solve uh, or anything that we can't answer today. So just to uh, set the stage, um, we're really talking about the availability of open educational resources. Um, as many of you know, digital content is radically changing the way that we think about curriculum with many districts rapidly replacing textbooks with digital content and leveraging open educational resources, which are free and openly licensed educational materials that can be used and repurposed for teaching, learning, research, and other purposes. So we see use of OER in my recent master's program, uh, where the professor directed students to watch an openly licensed video, or from an instructional designer curating lessons for her district pulled from different repositories. So I'll pause just for a minute, because we want to go ahead and just take a quick poll uh, to find out uh, how much you know about open educational resources and uh, if you have any experience with it. Yeah. 
And it looks like we, there's the poll. So you should see that on your screen if, yeah, perfect. If you just select yes or no, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. I, I, the, the, you know, that's good to hear. I, I think um, it's funny, three or four years ago, OER was a, a buzzword, kind of like uh, MOOC. <laughs> and uh, now we find that uh, a lot of people have heard of open educational resources. And when you talk to, to a lot of people and you mention OER, uh, it actually uh, resonates uh, pretty, pretty easily, especially with the educational community and understanding what it's all about and the uh, unbelievable impact uh, it can have is, is with rising costs of textbooks and, and certainly uh, the ability to provide uh, the most new and um, available material to uh, students to, to really improve those learning outcomes and en enhance the teaching uh, component. So this is where Blackboard Open Content really comes in. Um, every client uh, who uh, actually has uh, access to Blackboard Learn, Blackboard Classroom, or Moodle Rooms has access to open content. It is a cloud-based cross-platform global learning object repository uh, that you can maximize teacher efficiency and engage students with digital content. It provides the world of digital content at your fingertips. You can share and collaborate on digital resources with colleagues in your school, your district, or across the globe. Teachers can tag their created content with thousands of existing metadata labels. And with the Creative Commons copyright built right in, it enables sharing with permissions to control how content is shared, used, and altered. With Blackboard Open Content, these digital resources can even be organized into collections that can represent anything from a learning unit to a completed blending, blended or online course. So as I said, it's available uh, in Blackboard Classroom, Moodle Rooms, and Blackboard Learn. Uh, it serves over 10 million learners and educators. It's been accessed by over 73 countries. In fact, that's six of the seven continents. Uh, we're trying to find somebody in Antarctica actually to purchase Learn. So if you have any uh, potential prospects, please let me know. I would love to be able to say that we've uh, been accessed from seven of seven continents. And it's been installed on over 1,000 instances of Learn and Moodle Rooms. So in June uh, of this year, we provided instructors that were using Blackboard Learn the ability to launch directly from the content market into Blackboard Open Content, or directly from partner channels that included uh, CK12, Curriculum Pathways, and most recently, Open Ed. This was a, a long sought after feature uh, with the initial rollout of the uh, Ultra Experience for our Learn clients. Uh, they wanted the ability to be able to access the, uh, their native content and also open educational resources. So we were very excited to be able to provide this for our clients uh, as of June 19th. And that brings us to some very exciting news uh, that we announced on October 10th, which was the completion of an integration with Open Ed. Uh, thanks to this new partnership with Open Ed and our ongoing relationship with Curriculum Pathways and CK12, Blackboard Open Content now provides access to nearly a half a million OER resources. So we're really excited about uh, the partnership that we have with Open Ed and looking forward to uh, continuing to build that um, availability of resources so that we can provide as many options to uh, our clients as possible when they're looking to provide that content to their students. So we'll talk more about this during the demo, uh, but we do have some additional phases that uh, we've outlined to improve our integration with Open Ed. So for example, for phase two, uh, and as part of this, it's, it's really about full federation. So we wanna add Open Ed, uh, Open Ed content to the existing search filter that provides the ability to filter today by contributor, subject, grade level, and resource type or standards alignment. And we also want to incorporate uh, grade assessment passback uh, into the uh, associated LMS gradebooks. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Polina to uh, bring you up to speed a little bit if you're not too familiar with Open Ed. 
uh, and the exciting uh, things that they offer. And uh, then we'll kick off a demo and show you what it looks like in Blackboard Open Content. All right, thanks, Jace. Okay, uh, so uh, we kind of talked about why OER is great and why um, it's becoming used by more and more educators, but maybe to recap real quick, um, the content that you're going to see on OpenEd, the vast majority is free. It's accessible to anyone. Um, you don't have to be behind, you know, a VPN or some sort of firewall. It's all accessible at any time on any platform. Um, it's a quick source to go to to supplement your core coursework. So if you're teaching with a textbook or a certain other um, piece of curriculum, you can always come and find extra material to supplement that very easily. Um, and if you do happen to subscribe to a certain publisher to get extra content, you know, students <laughs> like us probably don't have the highest attention spans. So if you keep presenting the information uh, in, by the same talking octopus head over and over for the whole year, chances are they're going to get a little disengaged after a month or two. Um, and that also goes along with the fact that if the information comes from multiple different publishers, information is going to be presented in different ways. And so students um, that have different learning abilities will be able to grasp the concepts. Um, and of course, content that is new. So for example, textbooks will still tell you that Pluto is a planet, even though it's not. Uh, so if you need to prove to your students that no, it's not really a planet, I'm right, and the textbook is wrong, you can come to Open Ed and you'll actually see that there's over 100 uh, videos and other resources that will prove you right. So it's much, much easier and faster to cover emerging concepts. But uh, there is so many, there's a lot of problems out there right now with OER content. And the first is that a lot of the metadata, so the standards, the grades, the subjects, all the resources are crowdsourced. So anybody can come to a lot of these platforms and tag whatever standards they think are aligned to that resource. And you end up with this hodgepodge of one resource being aligned to over 30 standards. And chances are that's not accurate. And if you're the author and you're contributing some of your own material, you are not under any sort of agreements to keep it up for forever. So if you're a teacher and you find a resource that you love and you want to teach with it next week, uh, there's always a chance that it might not be there next week. One of the biggest problems, of course, is that the video quality doesn't have to be great. It's not vetted by anybody. If I want to create my own video of me recording in the class and sometimes the camera falls down and I'm talking way too softly and I might have really good intentions um, and want to explain something correctly, but unfortunately I might not be uh, right about it. There's nobody checking that. Um, and I think the biggest problem with it is time. It is so time consuming to go to Google and then go to YouTube and then go to Khan Academy and then go to PBS and type in your search terms or type in your standards and try to find the best videos for it. You don't want to go to all these different places to find what you need. Another problem is what if you want more than just videos or more than just text? Uh, what if you want games and you want assessments? And I think we've all seen that there's not that many free quality assessments out there. Um, so this is the challenges that we set out to face when we created the Open Ed Resource Library. And um, what we've done is we've aggregated all of the best resources from all the publishers online that we love. So this is just a subset of, some of a few of my favorites. We actually have over 20,000 other publishers on OpenEd. Um, so anything from NASA to all of Khan Academy's content, um, PBS content, Crash Course content, we've gathered it all, put it onto one place. So whenever you search for something, it's actually searching all of these catalogs as well as many, many, many other publishers. Okay. So that's Part of what we do differently is we take it all, take all the best content. Um, we actually get content suggested from our teachers. We get content suggested from our partners. And whenever somebody suggests, hey, I really like this publisher, we reach out to them. We see, is it really quality? Uh, do we like it? Is our are our students and teachers going to like it? And if uh, the answer is yes, we'll go ahead and bring that content on. So if you see something that is not on open ed, we're always happy to add it. And whenever we do add something to Open Ed, we will run it through machine learning. So instead of having our users crowdsource the standard alignments, what we do is we take the text out of a video, for example, and run it through machine learning. And machine learning will say, I think it's aligned to this, 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 and this standard. And then after that, our team of human curators will go through and either accept or reject what the machine learning came up with. So this twofold process guarantees that the resources are actually aligned to the standards that they say they are. 
So if you're searching for a certain standard and you really want to cover it today in class, you're guaranteed that you are getting the right video for the right standard. We also have a nightly automated job that runs through all of our resources. So if something is um, no longer there, if a publisher decided to take down a video, it'll catch that and remove it and will suggest a resource in its place. So you don't ever end up with this case of, oh my gosh, I pre-planned my lessons and half my resources aren't there. Um, and then as Jace mentioned, the next step is just searching for the content to find exactly what you need. Um, so the poll up right now is what I want to know. Have you guys heard of Open Ed before? Oh, I like that one. Yes, already. All right. Thank you for your response. Let's move on. Oh, there you go. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, one of the things that we do is we vet all of our resources. So instead of wanting to be the largest resource library out there, we're focused more on being the best, the highest quality. So whenever we are looking at new resources to add to our catalog, we have to go through this criteria. They need to be aligned to the standards accurately. And some of the times when we uh, add new resources to our library, those resources already have standards on them, and we'll ignore those standards. We want to come to the conclusions ourselves. So we'll ignore the standards if there's any already on the resources, and we'll do our process of running it through machine learning and then having our curators accept or reject it. Um, and oftentimes, actually, what we've done is we've shared what we found their standards to be with the publisher. So the publisher actually um, benefits from that because they get the right alignments on their standards, and they go back on their own websites and change the standards alignments. We want to make sure that uh, the delivery style is engaging. We want to make sure that it's high quality um, and that it's correctly delivered content. Uh, it should be device agnostic, so regardless of what sort of technology you're using in your classroom, and even if you're not using much technology in you know, computer labs, you're absolutely guaranteed that the resources are going to render correctly on your products. Uh, we also do not believe that there should be any ads on our content except for ads pointing to other educational content from the publisher. So you're not going to come across any of the weird ads you probably shouldn't see in school. Um, that is a very big criteria of ours. Um, and then some of the just uh, other ones is, of course, no uh, religious holidays, no references to that, no sarcasm, which is an odd one, but and uh, no candy, no witchcraft, that kind of thing. Now, I see Barbara says she can't hear me. Can everybody else hear me? Yeah, Pauline, I can. Okay. Um, well, I'll take a second to see if we can help Barbara out. Barbara, it might just be, you know, your connection. Um, but if you if you can't hear, I'll go ahead and you can go ahead, Pauline, and keep moving for uh, the rest of us, and I will try to help Barbara out in the chat. Sounds good. Okay. All right, so this is just a little bit more about how we do our machine learning and why we stand behind our standard alignments. So as I mentioned, what we do first is we aggregate all of the content into our library, and then we'll take, for example, for videos, we'll take the text off of the videos and process that through machine learning. Um, and then our team of human curators will go back and make sure that it is what it is. Um, and actually, any time that the curators either accept or reject the alignment, that helps machine learning figure out how good of a job it's doing and improve. So this um, process happens over and over, um, hundreds of resources a day. And over time, the machine learning gets even more and more accurate. So a lot of people ask me, how accurate is it? Um, and that actually completely depends on two things. The first is, what standard is it? So for example, for Common Core Math, because we have a lot of resources on Common Core Math, and we've done the uh, machine learning on the resources so often that the success rate of just machine learning, even before the human curation team gets to it, is over 90%. Um, and then on resources, for example, videos that are only two sentences long or um, don't have a, as much um, speech in them as they do maybe visual imagery, then it's not going to be very accurate because there's not enough for machine learning to go off of. So it totally depends. So that's why we have our team of human curators, curators on top of the machine learning. Okay, so uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of how we got to the resource library that we have. 
uh, as I mentioned, we started with all of the, um, the videos, the games, the interactives from all those wonderful publishers. And uh, we realized, hey, we have all of these awesome resources, but how do we figure out which students need which resources? So what we started doing is creating uh, about five question formative assessments for every standard. Um, and this kind of helps, for example, if a teacher is teaching to a certain standard today and she wants to see how well their her students are understanding it, they can assign this formative assessment and it's going to target just that one standard. Um, but what we do that's awesome, I think, is for every question in that assessment, we attach a hand-picked video or game to it. So that way, for every question that a student misses, they're presented with the exact video that they need to watch in, their, in order to help understand that topic. So what you end up with is giving students quizzes to see where they're at, and if they don't understand something, they're getting the exact resource they need served up to them automatically. So uh, for our teachers, we've gotten super uh, good po uh, positive feedback from there because instead of sifting through a resource library and trying to figure out which resources to assign to which students and where are they lacking and what do they need, the quizzes kind of help determine that on their own. And this is kind of what a quiz looks like. So it's usually a question on the left, answer on the right. Uh, for your wrong answers, as this one is, you will get a rationale at the bottom. So in this case, I reversed my ratio. It should have been 1 to 4 instead of 4 to 1. And so it says, because you got this question wrong, here are the two videos that you can watch to help improve um, and understand what's going on here. And because we're very much aware that students like uh, to watch different types of videos and have different learning styles, we usually like to present two videos that are from different publishers that present the information in different ways. So in this case, you can see there's a Khan Academy video that is presented um, to help students understand ratios. And then there's also a Math of Mr. Almino one. All right. um, and why do we believe in the power of our assessments? Why do we think that it's important that our assessments have the resources tied to them to help the students? And do the resources actually help the students? Um, so every item in the assessments is actually not aligned to um, like Common Core or NGSS standards. They're aligned to um, a framework called the Holistic Framework by ACT. And this framework is um, even further unpacked. So one Common Core standard might translate to five of these skills. So you're getting a very, very granular um, association. So as this example says, one common core standard here is use um, trigonometric ratios uh, to solve uh, sine, cosine, and tangent, basically. So within this one standard, there's four different uh, things that it's actually measuring. So if a student, if, if um, a question was just tied to 6.srt.8, and they got a, uh, and the question was actually only on signs, but we gave them a video that's on sines, cosines, and tangents, that's not very good because maybe the student totally understands signs and it's only cosines that they're struggling with. So uh, instead what we do is each question, because it's aligned to this fine-grained skill, if they miss a question on tangents, they're going to get a video that's only on tangents. And what's the benefit of that? Well, obviously if a, min if a video is only two minutes instead of ten minutes, the student is much more likely to watch it and they're also much more likely to get exactly the information that they need. So this is what we try to do. We try to minimize the amount of um, backtrack that a student has to do. Instead, we focus on exactly what they need and we serve up the right resource for that. So step one is identifying the knowledge gaps, and then step two is finding the exact video to help fill it. Okay. Um, and then what we do is we actually study our data. So over millions of assessments taken and millions of students on our site, what we do is we see, okay, student took assessment A, and they got this question wrong. And so because they got this question wrong, Open Ed suggested this video. And then if the student decides to take a post-assessment or the teacher assigns a post-assessment and they get that similar question right, and that tells us, hey, that video really helped them understand that topic. And sometimes, of course, the video doesn't help the student. On the post-assessment, they might answer that similar question wrong, in which case that video didn't help them. So based on this, did it help or did it not, we calculate the efficacy ranking for every resource. So what that means is, uh, if you're doing a search, instead of um, us preferentiating certain publishers or um, certain keywords, instead we just serve up the videos first that are the most effective. 
So for you as a teacher, that means whenever you're doing a search, you are getting the best resources that have been proven to work the best for students um, first. So you don't have to sift through all of the results. You can just kind of go with the first um, couple and be guaranteed that those are the best ones for what you're looking for. And uh, as I mentioned, we don't favor any sort of publisher. So if in one category, like preparing for higher math, Khan Academy is doing well, we'll give them a Khan Academy video. If um, Khan Academy doesn't perform as well in a different subject, we might suggest vocabulary for knowledge of language. So um, like I said, it doesn't matter who the publisher is. It matters how well that resource has performed for other students. All right. Okay, and um, this is just kind of uh, what you get. This is a few resources. So when I did a uh, search on the standard, I get 82 resources. And of course, they vary from videos to assessments. Um, and you get all of the metadata on them. Everything is ordered by the efficacy ranking. And um, yeah, this is exactly the content that you will find inside of Blackboard. All right, Jace, take it away. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to get the demo set up. Um, I think this is a great time for uh, any specific uh, questions uh, for uh, Paulina in regards to open ed. Um, certainly, as you can see, there are a lot of really uh, great features uh, that we can take advantage of. So as we continue to uh, take our basic integration and, and roll in different phases, as I mentioned before, we're really excited about taking advantage of this and uh, you know, ultimately what it's going to lead to, which is, as I mentioned before, improve student outcomes in the classroom. Any questions, guys? All right, I'm going to pause for just a minute, make sure everybody can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. I'm going to kind of do this a little bit slow because um, I know that uh, sometimes uh, there can be a little bit of delay depending on where you are in the world. And since we're fortunate enough to have somebody joining us all the way from Qatar, um, I would uh, definitely like <laughs> to uh, take it a little bit slower just to make sure that uh, they can follow along. So Barbara, let us know if, uh, if everything is looking good or if we need to slow down. Um, and uh, we certainly... Uh, thank Melissa in advance for her understanding if we take this a little bit slower than usual. Okay, so I'm going to start off with uh, our clients that have the uh, original experience and let you uh, see how um, you can access just a, as a refresher. Uh, the original way to access Blackboard Open Content was through the Build Content link. Um, and that still works today, but now we have uh, within the content market, uh, you now see the ability to access uh, these different channels. So you have CK12, Curriculum Pathways, um, Blackboard Open Content in general, which will give you access to all these things, and you can launch directly to Open Ed Content. So we really wanted to provide our, our clients the ability to get as quickly as possible to what they're looking for, while at the same time not uh, you know, restricting the availability of everything. So I'm going to go ahead and just click the main one. And uh, the first thing that you'll notice is, is that, you know, nothing has really changed here. Um, you can continue to search here for content uh, within the application. So for example, if I click K-12. Now, what you'll notice is, is that we, um, you'll, you'll see under resources, you have a, a button for open ed and a button for native content. And um, in order to get this uh, integration in place as quickly as possible so that our, our clients could take advantage of it, um, we basically went ahead and sort of created this bridge, um, which still allows you the ability to access your native content, but also gives you the ability to access open ed content. Um, and you just simply just have to click here and it will provide the open ed content underneath. Uh, in addition to that, um, what we've done is on the discover page, we've created direct links uh, to open ed so you can get there here and here. 
Um, and again, this was just an effort to try to ensure that clients had the ability to get to open ed content um, no matter what uh, they were doing. And again, as I mentioned before, if you go back to the, um, the course and the content market, you'll see that you actually have the ability to get directly there. Uh, again, I'll start with the original course and then we'll kick over to the ultra course or the ultra experience. So as you see, you get directly into the open ed content and you can here you can basically see that there's 455,420 resources. Paulina, that's 10 more than uh, the other day. So that's great to see. Uh, yeah, we're looking right. forward to seeing that continue to increase. Good, we always are. All right, so let's go back. Um, and now I want to just quickly show you uh, in the ultra experience. So. Um, with the original experience, again, you had the ability to get there this way. Um, for those of you who have the original ex or the ultra experience or are looking into the original experience, um, you'll notice that that doesn't exist. So we wanted to basically provide a, a way for people to uh, access the content uh, while at the same time making it fairly simple. So again, accessing the content market, and you'll see you have the links to CK12, Blackboard Open Content Curriculum Pathways, and Open Ed, just like you did before, um, or just like you did uh, with the original um, experience. And again, I'll just click CK12, for example, to show you. And again, here you can access the CK12 content directly. Again, you're not prohibited from going back here to, to the main content within Blackboard Open Content and searching uh, from here whenever you need to. Uh, it's just, again, a, a resource so that you can get to that content as quickly as possible. So now that we're here, let's go ahead and do a little bit of a, a demo here. So I'm going to go ahead and search cells. And when I do that, again, you're going to see that it lists the, the total amount of resources down here, which is uh, a little over 3,600. And then it breaks it down between open ed and native resources. And again, native resources are those that um, were already made available uh, by those, uh, those institutions or those instructors uh, across the globe that wanted to share content that was relative to cells. And they tagged that within the content that they created. But let's go back to open ed. And we will just click one of these here. All right, so we have Mr. W's Cell Song. Um, and uh, you see you have a video here and you have related resources. Uh, and then certainly when you look at the information about, it lets you know uh, that it's available uh, via iTunes. Uh, it's got some lyrics. Uh, this particular one doesn't have tags, um, but it does look like if you go to version information, it is uh, um, copyright licenses. It's not a de no derivative works are allowed um, in non-commercial uses only. So in this case, you wouldn't be able to create a, a an alternate version of this resource, but you certainly can use it. Um, and what's great about open content and open ed is, is I can go and I can add this to more than one course at a time. So as you see here, I've chosen the, the biology course that I'm in with the ultra experience. If I add another course, which is my original experience course, I can actually choose where I want to put this. So let's go put it in the chemical basis of life uh, in both courses. And I simply click add. And you'll see over here, it says content successfully added on the right hand top right hand corner. And now if I go back to my course, And I'm going to show you first in the ultra experience. So I think we said the chemical basis of life. And there's the cell song. And when I click this, you'll see. Now I did want to quickly mention every time that you see that um, something is opening, you'll see that uh, thing pop up with an LTI launch. Uh, so content in the LMS is stored as LTI links. And those links remain active forever, even if the author retires the links from future searches. Um, so it is never deleted for existing users unless it's actually deleted uh, by the instructor from the course. Um, just to give you a little bit more information, so learning tools interoperability is a global standard way for product suppliers and institutions to securely connect their learning platforms and tools 
while reducing the time and significant costs associated with developing separate product integrations. So with LTI, you can basically connect to a resource, confirm the tool and user's access, and then securely exchange data. So again, you see the access from the resource there. And now if I go to the original course, and I go down here to the chemical basis of life, you will see that there is a link to the cell song. And again, using the magic of LTI, there it is. So that's a really great feature that uh, sometimes um, uh, our clients aren't uh, necessarily uh, aware of until they, they have uh, more time to uh, experiment with uh, what open content offers. But as you can see, I just took um, content from open ed and I added it to two courses uh, at the same time, which is uh, definitely something that is uh, we've gotten feedback from numerous clients that is uh, really advantageous, especially when you're trying to create uh, curriculum that spans multiple courses. So I want to run you through another scenario. And again, I'll use Ultra. Uh, and this time I'm just going to access open content. And this time I'm going to click channels. So I'll pause for just a minute. Channels in Blackboard open content are a mechanism for users to organize and group content together in an, in an ad hoc fashion. So users can subscribe to channels that allow subscription and add content to channels that are open for contribution. Uh, you think of channels as a, a social collaboration tool that allows users to share with other users who are interested in similar topics and types of content. So I'm going to choose this one, which is Common Core. And I'm just going to go ahead and select this Practice Poster K1. And you'll see when I click the information, the different things here that are available. It's been associated with kindergarten and first grade. It's tagged with Common Core and, and math. Uh, and you see these standards listed under here. Now, these aren't all the available standards. Um, you actually have the ability to load additional standards from your open content settings. And I'm going to show you that real quick. So if I go into my Blackboard content settings, uh, there's two, two key things in here. The first one is, is what type of copyright license you want to associate as a default with things that you create. And the second thing is all of the available standards. So here you see these are the five standards that are currently, excuse me, selected. I can click edit and it will give me access to thousands of standards across different states. Uh, and we are constantly, um, we actually have a, another round of this that is uh, coming up very soon where we refresh the academic benchmarks is what we call them. Uh, and load those into the system so that they're, so we make sure that they're up to date with the latest and greatest. But again, I can choose different states and I can choose different content areas and I can add things uh, that I choose to add. Okay, so just wanted to show you that. And I'll pause just for a minute because I'm now going to go into Blackboard uh, Classroom and show you a workflow. Melissa, I am actually, that is a great question. Um, that is something that I am uh, inquiring with the uh, academic benchmarks. Um, as I said, we're doing another round of that. Uh, so the, your timing is excellent and I will certainly make sure that I reemphasize uh, the importance of, of obtaining those and getting those loaded into open content. And just for those who are gonna be listening to the recording who may not see the chat, we had a question about whether or not the Canadian version of the standards, if we have those, that was Jace's reply. Okay, perfect. Okay, so going into Moodle rooms uh, and Blackboard Classroom. Again, I'm logged in. Um, I'm in my course, which is accessibility. And this time I am going to add content to my Blackboard class, pla Blackboard Classroom, excuse me. So same workflow if you've ever been in Moodle Rooms uh, that exist today, so no changes there. 
Um, but what you will find and you will have the ability to access is the same exact uh, open ed content that is available to our Learn clients. So in this case, um, I'm actually going to uh, search for the word access. And uh, I'm going to use uh, my collection. So collections uh, in Blackboard Open Content are a group of shared resources that are organized around a specific structure that you can add as a whole into a course or a channel. A collection may consist of an entire course or a single lesson or module with content, assignments, quizzes, and related activities. For example, your collection might consist of an entire fifth grade science course or a unit on photosynthesis. So in this case, I'm going to click the collection. And as you can see, I can actually select this entire course if I wanted to. And I could go ahead and add that. But in this case, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to choose a module. So let's take module four. And again, I am going to add that to the course. And as I showed you before, I'm not, I don't just add it to the root and then I have to try to, you know, figure out how to move it around. I can actually add it right where I want it. So I'm going to add it to week four and click add, excuse me. And you'll see content successfully added. And again, I go back to my accessibility course. I go to week four, and you can see that the content is added. Just, just so that I can highlight, highlight our integration, integration with Ed. Ed. Again, I'm again, getting this access to black content, content through the classroom. classroom. Again, I can, again, I can discover, discover a change. I can click in it logo directly. directly. I can type I can in type access, access there. there. And I have quite a few resources. Not sure what this sure says, but I'm going to click it. Perfect. And again, I can add it with a single click, or I can add it to a specific place. Again, I'm going to go ahead and add it to a specific place. I'm going to put this in week five. It's been added. I'm going to go back to the course. Click week five. There's my tool. One click. And there it is. So as you can see, this uh, the open ed content is available today for you to access and take advantage of uh, in both Learn and Blackboard Classroom, um, as well as Moodle Rooms. I uh, certainly am very much looking forward to working with our, our partners in Paulino over at Open Ed to uh, enhance the integration uh, experience for our clients. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, provide that true federation uh, as well as uh, take advantage of uh, what we can with all of the work that they've done with the assessments and the ability to really drive uh, students towards uh, improving those outcomes. So I'll pause and see if there's anything specific that uh, questions that folks have or any anything they would like to cover. So Jace, it looks like we're just getting a big thumbs up that it was inf really good information. Okay, great. Well, I'll tell you that the demo really makes a difference. I think I think all of our um, audience members, both on the session today and our recording, are going to really appreciate that. Very exciting stuff. Yeah, and again, thanks to Open Ed for just the ability to, uh, you know, give a uh, create a, a an ability and 
for our clients to have access to so many resources that have been, you know, carefully vetted and certainly the time that they've taken to uh, ensure as best as possible uh, the quality of the resources that are available to our clients. You know, we often talk about um, open content as a place for folks to create, share, and discover. And, you know, in, in all fairness, uh, we see that most of the clients like to discover uh, what's out there. And so the more that we can um, leverage what uh, open content has already done and the work that they've done with uh, the publishers to, to really identify and bring in uh, that quality content that is both up to date and aligned with standards. Uh, it's going to make that, uh, that process, um, you know, a lot more fun uh, and exciting because there's going to be so many different resources out there for instruction instructors and instructional designers and institutions to be able to uh, take advantage and leverage. Well, very good. Jason Pointer, this has been a really great session, and um, I, I'm very excited to share it with our, our overall community. So for those who are joining us today, please um, share these resources uh, with your colleagues so that they can also learn about open content um, and uh, view this presentation themselves. Uh, you can do all of that uh, by leading people to the YouTube channel for our bit sessions, which is tinyurl.com slash Bits K12. Um, they can also, and you can also join the Blackboard community site, our professional learning community, and learn community.blackboard.com slash groups slash K12 bits. And finally, um, if there's folks that you know will benefit from our entire bits series, we invite them to uh, also sign up for the rest of our, our sessions at tinyurl.com bits slash bits fall 2017. So those they're in the chat as well um, as in our follow-up from today for everyone who signed up uh, for today's session. We'll make sure we include those links. So again, Paulina and Jace, thank you so much um, for some, some super information. Great job. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to catching you on the next uh, bit series, everybody. Next bit session. Thanks, everybody.